Let me lead us in prayer as we consider God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for speaking to us already through your word as your word was read to us. We pray, Heavenly Father, as we now think it through together, you'd be at work in our hearts by your Holy Spirit, bringing us to all truth and convicting us of those areas where we need conviction. We pray, Heavenly Father, that as a result of our time in your word this morning, we might live lives that bring you honour and glory more and more. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this COVID thing is all a little bit strange, isn't it? Uh, You've got audio presentations at various points, video presentations now this morning, but it also brings with it some unexpected bonuses. And so if you tuned in for church last week online, you would have got the unexpected uh, bonus of hearing Simon Reeve preach and before that, Kurt Langmead as well. Uh, Why? Why are we revisiting this old stuff? Well, We chose to revisit the sermon series that we had previously done on Ecclesiastes for two reasons. Uh, One was very obvious and practical. We were looking for ways to make things easier for us in this completely new space. And secondly, we wanted to revisit that book because it's so appropriate for this particular time and situation. Uh, Have a think about it. As Australians over the last two years, all the things that we tend to think of as solid and rely upon have been revealed to us as frail and shallow things. A bit like the mist or fog on a New England morning, an autumn morning, a bit like that looks solid and strong, but actually it doesn't have any lasting substance. We had, for instance, previously thought about how our bigger towns and cities couldn't possibly run out of water. Armidale has Malpas Dam. It would be fine. But a severe two-year drought revealed that as flawed thinking for us. At the same time, the food security that we tend to bank on was revealed as shallow due to the widespread nature of the dry. And then came the fires. And our philosophy of letting friendly nature take its course has at least come under question. And then along came a new virus. And with it, a financial crisis that few could have imagined. We're now looking at something in the vicinity of 10% unemployment. And far from a budget surplus, we're looking at a huge national debt that we will be repaying for the foreseeable future. No certainty, no security in wealth and in our strength. In the same way, COVID-19 threatens our health and brings our mortality into focus at at front and centre. And so even more, the virus has now disrupted even the relationships that many of us put into first place. It's like God has been stripping away all those things that we tend to see as really important for us. So now we have families unable to meet and gather, even at important things like funerals or weddings, and even our church family is now scattered across the internet. Now, I wonder which of these realities has impacted you the most. And and I wonder, could that possibly reveal in us an earthly reliance on something that's less than healthy? I know for me, our situation has caused me to do some rethinking and rebalancing against the word of God. And in the book of Ecclesiastes, most wonderfully, the teacher hammers away at our perspectives. He has, from his own experiences and observations, been challenging the things that we more normally consider as foundational and he's weighed them against eternal things. So in Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verse 12, For who knows what is good for mortals, while they live the few days of their vain life, which they pass like a shadow. For who can tell them what will be after them under the sun? We don't know the future. And so much of what we spend our time seeking after and building on is, in this world is, 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 is just a vapour, a breath, a short-lived mist, haval. It all sounds so depressing, I guess. But remember, 
that not all that we see is Havah. There are things that last and there is one who knows what is good and what the future holds. God knows and his things last. And more good news, in line with God's kindness, even the short-lived and fickle things, well, they have their place and their time as well. The trick is making sure that they're in their right spot. We have to have a different perspective than the rest out there. The teacher says the human things, those things under the sun, don't last. But in chapter 3, verse 14, he crucially observes, I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that people will look for meaning and certainty in money, in skills, in looks and reputation? No. Will put their health and their families and their environment above all other things? No. So that people will be able to see and experience every pleasure and feel satisfied before they die? No. Let's finish Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 14. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that people will fear him. So that people will put him first in their thinking and their considerations and their responses. If nothing else then these last few years in Australia should have had us looking back to God, acknowledging our complete dependence upon him, listening to him and weighing our thoughts and decisions and actions light in comparison to his. And so we come to Ecclesiastes chapter 6. A short chapter missing from our recorded sermons earlier in the year. So you get me, liveish. Here, the teacher looks at a different aspect of wealth. In the last chapter, there was the call to be serious and sober about your approach to God. Now, I don't think he was talking about church, by the way, there. The temple of the Old Testament was replaced not with a building, but by a person, Jesus. We draw near to God through Jesus, not by going to a certain place or structure, and that's Great news for us in the situation we find ourselves now. Being serious about our response to Jesus is about as serious as a person should get. And lining up our lives with what he wants from us as his people is a serious undertaking. To love money is to never have enough money. To have too much to consume means that others are going to consume it. The abundance of riches increases stress and takes away rest, the teacher had said. But he ended the chapter saying that it's good for a person to eat and drink and to find satisfaction in their work. He says also that when God gives wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, then be glad, acknowledging the gift and the giver. And I think here is where the perspective change is most clear for us. For the humanist, the earthly materialist, the atheist, all good things must come from where? From themselves, right? Or from those others around and about them. And therefore, the single-minded pursuit of these things for our own benefit actually seems pretty reasonable. If it's all about me, what I do, and what I get out of it from all my doing, then I'd just better be on about doing that. But for the believer, for the Christian person, there is another factor to consider, the factor to consider, in fact. That it's all about God, what he gives and what he cares about. That's what matters. That we're completely dependent on him in every area and acknowledge that truth in life and in thought. Chapter 6 begins like this. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, and it lies heavy upon humankind. Those to whom God gives wealth 
possessions and honour, so that they lack nothing of all that they desire, yet God does not enable them to enjoy these things, but a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity. It's a grievous ill. Well, a couple of words for us to be aware of here. Uh, remember the word haval, mist or breath. It appears not unhelpfully, in fact, I, I think rightly here in this particular case, as vanity. The idea that God would give, but that a person not enjoy is difficult, even impossible to grasp, and there's a, a certain vanity to it. Secondly, the word ra, translated evil at the start of this verse, and at the end of the verse, the same word is translated ill. Uh, more literally, it's sick. Something that really doesn't appear good or right or healthy. And here is a person to whom God gives good things, but they're not for him. It's kind of not right, at least from a human perspective. Two words pointing out a similar idea, and it's an observation that we can relate to, isn't it? Why would God give these things, and then the one to whom they are given doesn't get to use them? How many times have we seen something like this? Why did a person die before they published the third book of their trilogy? Why is this person so good at tennis but their real love is basketball? Why is this person wealthy but their relationship so poor with their children that there's no shared joy? It doesn't seem right in our eyes. It's kind of sick, wrong even evil from our perspective. It's not the way that we would do things. But this perspective key is the identity of the giver, isn't it? It is both God who gives and also God who determines the use. Not only is God responsible for the giving of gifts, but he's also responsible for how those gifts will work out. God gifts the gifts, but even then, that's not the end of the equation. He may or may not enable a person to enjoy or utilise that gift. What happens for us, what happens for you and for me, is completely, completely dependent on him. Now let that sink in for a moment. Here the teacher is speaking about wealth, possessions and honour unused. That's not a bad corrective to all of us who think that gifting, ability, even situation equals entitlement. In God's economy, we are not only dependent on him for what we have, but also for how or even if that gift will be used or enjoyed, or whatever. Him first, us after that. Him as king, and us under him. It kind of grates against us, doesn't it? I worked hard, I deserve. I was given this position, so I should get to have things my way. I'm as good as anyone else, so why shouldn't I get what everyone else gets? but that's not what we always see. And I'd be so bold as to say it's not even what we should expect. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, says the teacher, and it lies heavily upon humankind, those to whom God gives wealth, possessions and honour, so that they lack nothing of all that they desire, yet God does not enable them to enjoy these things, but a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity. It's a grievous ill. It's frustrating, but it's true. We are not the beings at the centre of the world. Frustrating, but true. Things don't always work out the way that we'd like them to. Frustrating, but true. We are, whether we like it or not, completely dependent beings, even on this side of our rebellion against God. 
the fall didn't throw off our need for God, only our safety before him. In verses 3 to 5, the teacher picks up a graphic and painful image, one no doubt painful even to some of us living today. The teacher says that it would be better to be a stillborn child with all the grief and heartache and loss that comes with that situation than for God to give wealth, possessions and honour but no enjoyment of them. As I read this little section, I, I can't but think about the rich person who somewhere has lost the love of his family, perhaps even his love for God. The one who sacrifices relationship for material and reputational gain. Did you notice in verse 3 that the rich man didn't even get a proper burial? It's as if at the end, no one loved him enough even to spend some of his own money to honour him when he died. Surely that's a sickness, a wrong in the world. And as a minister who runs funerals, I've seen it. This exact thing or numerous variations on the theme. The good things lost in the pursuit of lesser things. We can all be in danger of it. And the teacher says, you're better off being a stillborn child than to go through that experience. He's seen this again and again. In verse 7, he actually sees it everywhere. He says there in verse 7, All human toil is for the mouth, yet the appetite is not satisfied. And in verse 9, he says, Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of desire. This is also haval and a chasing after wind. Or to put it another way, satisfaction with what we have is better than endlessly chasing the dream. People chasing and never getting, chasing after the wrong things, focusing on the lesser while missing out on the better, out of their right places. It all seems a bit pointless and a tragedy. Discovery, strength, learning, even those things. In verses 10 to 11, he writes, Whatever has come to be has already been named, and it is known what human beings are and that they are not able to dispute with those who are stronger. The more words, the more vanity. So how is one the better? And it raises the obvious question. We've heard it before. For who knows what is good for mortals while they live the few days of their vain life, which they pass like a shadow? And here's the thing. We've also already heard the answer. God gives. Under the sun, that is, if only we're under the sun, then it is all pointless, a chasing after mist. But there is another perspective for us to see, isn't there? Something far more important to see and to grasp. God gives. There is a God who created there is a God who sets eternity in our hearts. There is a God who does those things that will endure forever. And there is a God to whom we must fulfil our vows and approach with due care. There is a God who gives gifts, even wealth, possessions and honour and the ability to enjoy them, if that's in line with his will and purpose. A God who has arranged things even the frustrating and the difficult things, just in such a way as to make people fear him. To put him first in their lives. In, to put him in his rightful place rather than filling that spot with all kinds of misty and vaporous things. As we look out on our world... At the moment, vaporous things are a little more obvious than usual, I think. 
What we see as we look out into the world is uncertainty and grief rising up and overwhelming the banks of human optimism. All of us have been forced to stop and to think and to reevaluate, to wonder why and how and what we should do next. Isn't that true? And for us who are Christians, brought back into a relationship of peace and safety with God through his gracious gift of his son Jesus, well, we have a knowledge and a foundation to rebuild upon. A solid and lasting foundation to rebuild upon and a solid and lasting foundation that can give shape to all the other things that we build. Even now, we can be recentering our lives on God as we acknowledge our complete dependence on him. As all those things that we have taken for granted have been stripped away from us. And we can be reprioritizing all our activities while we're here under the sun in such a way as to honor and acknowledge the one who gives the way that we actually should. Well, let me pray for us that Ecclesiastes 6 and indeed the whole book might be a helpful corrective to us even as we go through this period of uncertainty and isolation. So let me pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you stand over and above all things, that they have their time and their purpose in your goodwill. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that as we're forced to acknowledge our dependence on you, that we might submit ourselves to you and rest under your good hand. Help us to reorganise those passing things, those haval things that we live out our lives with. Help us to reorganise them in such a way as might be pleasing to you and good for us. And we pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, it's nice to be speaking to you at one level face to face, although all I can see is a camera as I speak. Uh, I'm prayerfully hoping that each of you is hanging in there, it's doing okay, and that uh, at least the little things that we've been able to do have been some help for you. And I pray that today will be as well. Thanks for being here.